To me, what's most fascinating about joy is that it is a state of being where we are deeply connected to ourselves and the world around us, even in the face of overwhelming adversity. Welcome to the Learn Skin Podcast with me, Dr. Raja. And me, Dr. Hadar, where we discuss all things skin. Join us as we delve into the art and science of skin health in today's episode. Hey, Raja, can you say the thing I told you to tell them? Of course. We are board-certified dermatologists. This podcast is meant for educational and informational purposes only and is not considered medical advice, nor does it serve as a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. All opinions shared do not express the views of Learn Health, Inc. Let's get to the good stuff. Hey, Raja. How are you today? Hey, Hadar. How's it going? You know, I think we're talking about some really interesting topics today, right? Stuff that gives you joy, my friend. Oh, yes. It makes me so happy to have our guest today because we're going to talk about how joy is such an important part of what we do. And I know it may sound a little corny, but it is key in the treatment room that people have a positive attitude about the whole visit. I think any clinician knows that if you go into that room and there's a negative vibe in the room and you're not able to turn this right around, doesn't matter what the cause is, It could be that you have a kid in the room and they're upset and pissed off. It could be that you're running late. It could be so many different things. But if you have the ability to create positive karma in the room, bring this positive energy up, you are healing your patient right there and then. And so we need to talk about how to bring joy to our lives and maybe it'll infiltrate into the treatment room. What do you think? I think we need an expert to talk about this, although I agree with you. But we're pretty in for a treat today because we've got Dr. Mina Jolipoli, who is a board-certified pediatric dermatologist coming to us all the way from Houston at Bluebird Dermatology. She's also a children's book author, and I've never heard this before, but she's a joyologist in the school of life. So I have to say, in general, probably board-certified dermatologist and perhaps a board-certified joyologist if there's such a thing. Mina, thanks for joining us. Hi, well, I'm so so grateful to be here to talk about my favorite subject, joy. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you know, Mina, that's a good idea to add that as a board certification in joy because you are triple board certified, if I'm not mistaken. So did pediatrics residency, dermatology residency, and then did an extra year of pediatric dermatology. So really, really indulged in your training, but also learned how to make it joyful. So let's jump right into it. And Why don't you start by telling our listeners why cultivating joy is so important to our health? What is joy? How do we cultivate it? Why is it so important to us? Oftentimes, we tend to think of joy as a feeling we get when something good happens in our lives. But it's really about finding good in everything that happens, even amidst the challenges. To me, what's most fascinating about joy is that it is a state of being that where we are deeply connected to ourselves and the world around us, even in the face of overwhelming adversity, and that we can create and cultivate. And it's something that I teach my patients. It's something that I that I work on in my own life and with my family members. And when you are deeply connected to that, it helps you build the intuition of what your mind, what your body, what your heart, soul, all of that needs. And then you don't need anybody else. It's just something that when you are deeply connected to those things, it allows you to be the healthiest that you can be physically, emotionally, mentally, socially, and spiritually as well. And so I get it. Happy go lucky, you know, have a positive attitude on life. I think it's a great thing. And I want to talk to you about strategies on doing that. But is there evidence that this really is good for our health and our well-being? Yeah, I mean, Susan David, Harvard Medical School psychologist, talks about the concept of emotional agility, the, the practice of using our feelings as information about our needs and our values and whether they're being met and in a way that we're not trying to control them or trying to fix them. We're acknowledging them, we're learning and growing from them, and then we can choose to respond intentionally as a result. I think it's actually really important to distinguish joy from the toxic positivity, this this kind of Pollyanna notion that 
everything happens for a reason. You just need to move on. And, you know, how do you tell that to a parent who has a child that's diagnosed with cancer or loses a child as a casualty in war or in a school shooting? So joy is not the absence of sadness. It actually is what allows us to experience the full range of human emotions. I actually think of it kind of like a swing. At that moment where time stands still, you have to commit to powering through the depths to reach new heights. You can't feel the heights of joy without experiencing all of what makes us a human, including sometimes sadness and grief. I actually took my nephews to see the new Inside Out 2 movie this morning. And it was funny because it was so much of what I talk about when I talk about joy. There's sadness, there's grief, there's fear, there's anxiety, there's anger and all of that. But even in those things, there's something that we can learn and grow from them and then actually be able to kind of tap into what we can learn from it and then turn it into joy. I get a feeling already that this is going to be one of these topics where we're not just doing this for our patients. By doing it for our patients and for our loved ones, we are also doing it for ourselves if we can really influence and cultivate this joy. So let's talk about some strategies on doing this, and maybe you can give us a bit of a background on this concept of healing versus curing and surviving? How can we discuss these topics and be able to have the right tools to cultivate joy in an effective way? For me, it kind of started out with just realizing that I used to work in an academic setting. I used to see 50 patients a day, and I had probably five, 10 minutes at most with each patient. And so the healing that I could provide in that kind of setting was very limited. It really just focused on their physical well-being. But with visible skin differences, as you both know, there's so much more involved with that. There's so much more that affects our self-esteem, our self-image, anxiety, depression, bullying. And so one of the ways that evolved is I've been involved with Camp Discovery. The American Academy of Dermatology sponsored summer camps for kids with chronic and severe or life-threatening or psychologically debilitating skin conditions. And what I saw when I spent a week with these kids, I got to actually see how they lived, how what they had to deal with every day and how they lived with their skin condition, not just what I saw in a short clinic visit. And It was probably the most powerful education that I could have ever received, so much more than I could have ever learned in a a textbook. And even to this day, when someone tells me that they're interested in pediatric dermatology, that's one of the first things I tell them to do is to go to camp so that you can actually see what these kids have to deal with every day. And during the course of that week, they might come in very shy and quiet, very unsure of who they are. And through the course of the week, because it's a safe space where they get to learn about who they are, their strengths. They get to challenge themselves in new ways. They get to stretch themselves outside of their comfort zone, make new friendships and connections. They get to realize they have the knowledge that they are not alone. For so many of these kids, it's the first time that they're ever meeting someone else who has the same exact skin condition that they have. And camp is probably some of the most powerful medicine that I can prescribe because they finally feel like they're not alone. And they leave that week with tools to be able to face some of the challenges they face in their everyday world a little bit better. And if we can continue to reinforce that more throughout the rest of the year when they're not in camp, then it starts to become their new state of being, their new default. So whenever they face challenges, which we can't put people in a bubble all the time, whenever they face those challenges, they know that they have those inherent superpowers to navigate them as they come. And so when I opened up my own practice, now I'm in a direct care practice where I get to spend as much time with them as they need. I get to talk to them about nutrition and stress reduction. And my favorite question to ask my patients is, what brings you joy? And when I ask that, because they're usually caught off guard because they've never had a doctor ask them that before. Yes, they, love it. <laughs> <laughs> but they sit up a little taller, their eyes get a little wider, and they share something deep within their heart. And I have met the most talented authors, musicians. I had a 12-year-old talk to me about sous vide cooking. I had a nine-year-old tell me that she loves to rap. And I said, all right, spit some lyrics for me right now. And she said, I'm the best. I'm me. I'm the best at being me. And I I got really tearful because one of the things that I tell my patients is there is no one that ever was, is, or will be the uniquely beautiful being in front of me. And she 
that takes adults their whole lives to understand. And this kid understood that at nine years old. And so when they start to, one of the other things that I tell my patients is that the pain and suffering that you're experiencing right now, the challenges that you're facing right now is going to become a superpower. And they look at me like I'm crazy, but when they start to kind of, you know, go through this process of going to camp, doing the workshops and, 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 you know, having me kind of help them, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, socially, all of those things, because we're inherently compassionate human beings, they start to have the recognition that what they've experienced is actually something that makes them stronger, kinder, and more compassionate towards the pain and suffering of others. And the world could use a lot more love like that. And my practice philosophy is educate, empower, uh, advocate. And what I mean by that is when education is not just me telling them what to do, it's me learning their story, learning about where they've been, because how can I help them get them get to where they want to go if I don't know where they've been? And once we've developed that sacred relationship of trust, then we can actually start to kind of work together with my knowledge and their experience of how can we empower them with those tools that they that they already inherently have and bring them out so they can start advocating for themselves. And like I said, when, because we're inherently compassionate human beings, what ends up happening is they start to advocate for others. And then they don't need me anymore. They are already on that path to joy for themselves. That was very powerful, Mina. Thank you for sharing that experience about the camp and kind of how you learned from that. Because I think I think you're right. We all need to add this kind of attitude to our practice, to our daily practice, and to the way we conduct ourselves around the world. I think what I heard you say, especially in relations to camp, is the concept of resilience. And perhaps you can discuss a little bit how these two concepts interact, this idea of resilience and, and joy. So the HeartMath Institute has about 40 years of research focusing on coherence. And actually, neurocardiologists have done a lot of research. I didn't even know there was a whole field of neurocardiology, but there is. Wow. And what, and what they've discovered is that the heart actually has its own independent nervous system. The heart actually sends more signals to the brain than the brain sends to it. The heart and brain are in constant communication, but it's the heart that actually is doing most of the talking. The heart is the, the organ that gets the first signal and that has a measurably different signal that it sends to the brain when we're in states of depleting emotions like frustration, anxiety, anger, guilt versus regenerative uplifting emotions like gratitude, appreciation, compassion, joy. And they've measured that through heart rate variability analysis. And our heart rates don't beat like metronome. The time between each heartbeat is dependent on how we breathe, how we eat, our sleep, our environment, and our emotions. And when we are in state of regenerative uplifting emotions like joy, our heart rate variability is actually in sync. And when our heart and our brain and our bodies are all communicating in a coherent fashion, then we are able to heal better. Our emotions are, we have more stable emotions. We are able to regulate them better. We are able to, we have improved mental function, performance, clarity, focus. And so it actually behooves us to know how to do this. And so that's yes. one of the ways that we can actually, it allows us to be more adaptable. There's another psychologist, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, who has come up with the broaden and build theory. And it's it states that we don't just experience that contentment and joy and all of that in the moments that we're experiencing those emotions, what it actually does is reinforce, kind of broadens our awareness for new ideas and thoughts that are reflective of those emotions. It helps us build those cognitive, social, emotional skills so that we can be more creative in problem solving, though we can be more adaptable, more resilient to stress. And then you have more positive emotions and it's just this kind of rinse and repeat cycle. And that's especially important in states of stress and trauma because it acts as a buffer to the development of depression and anxiety. And so things like camp allows people to build those, those emotions. And, and by the way, I've been doing it for almost 20 years. And the reason why I keep doing it is because it also does that for me right. as well. <laughs> and I do want to kind of put in a plug for this camp discovery because it, because of the pandemic and we weren't doing it for a while, the enrollment is actually really low. And the strategy lately, I, I was in a memo recently and it said something about how we can't rely on the dermatologists as we have in the past to fill these spots for these camps, which actually made me really sad because this is an American Academy of Dermatology sponsored camp 
for our patients. And we're not referring these kids to camp. And what, what that tells me is that I feel like we're a little bit disconnected to the value of not just curing and fixing disease, but also healing. Strong words. I agree. And I'm kind of saddened to hear that we don't make the most of this. So absolutely. If you're listening out there and you have a kiddo who could benefit from this camp, look it up. If you're a member of the American Academy of Dermatology, then that should be easy. It's, but it's, also, not, it's also just Google. free. Yeah. It's free to the kids. I think that's, of course. A, that's yeah, it's really important. important. To mention. <laughs> yeah. You hit on a point that I thought is very important. I actually wrote for myself, talked about resilience and gratitude, which is the two concepts I'm more familiar with and, and try to kind of build that up for my patients. This idea of gratitude that you mentioned makes me think in relationship to joy and how we can increase that for ourselves, our loved ones, our patients. And kind of speaking on what you mentioned about the heart, do you think this is something that we can totally manage from the outside in? I mean, obviously, a lot of emotions arise, and so some of us are built differently, and our heart is going to have that variability, depending on the situation we're at, and maybe we can control it a little bit, maybe with some breath work, and we can talk about some specifics in a minute. But can you conceptually talk about this idea of we can influence this, we can take control of this, and by maybe showing gratitude, learning how to improve our ability to show gratitude and, and be cognizant of the world around us. We can actually make physical changes in our body, feel more joy, and then maybe promote health. Can, can you speak about that relationship from the outside in? Absolutely. I actually think at the foundation of all joy is gratitude. And one of the things that I teach my patients and families and something that I do myself is I, I don't get out of bed until I feel grateful for existence, a joy for life and whole. And it's actually a very, so I always do a gratitude practice the minute that I find myself awake. And if we start the day, I, I feel like gratitude and in all the meditation teachings that I've received, gratitude is that kind of ultimate state of receivership. So when your heart is focused, when you open your heart with gratitude, you're open to receiving whatever the day brings. There's so many things that can happen for the rest of the day, but every day you get to get out of bed with a clean slate. So if you start the day in gratitude with the intention that you're going to learn as much as you can, you're going to receive both the good, the bad, the in-between, you're already kind of setting yourself up for a good day. Again, things might knock you down, but if you start, why not give yourself of starting on that fresh slate? every day. So I do think that is an important way to kind of start. And it, and, it, and you kind of touched on intention. So another way that I kind of, I, I, I don't tell myself that I have to go to work today. I don't even say I get to go to work today. I say I come to play. Even putting that intention out there before I've even started my day already starts it with the intention that I'm going to enjoy myself ahead of the experience. So I am creating that emotion in my body, in my mind, ahead of the experience. And so then now my mind is going to focus on all the things that's going to validate that intention. And then I do a lot of different things to, to play throughout the day. I mean, I work with kids, so it's quite easy to do that. But one of, <laughs> <laughs> but one of the gifts that I feel like I have is I've never lost that sense of childlike curiosity, wonder, and awe that I had as a child about the world and everyone and everything in it. For me, joy is a lot about curiosity, exploration, and connection. And so those are things that I continue to cultivate throughout the day. And that to me leads to joy, not just in my life, but also in work and something that I can also spread. Thank you. And so you mentioned, Mina, this practice in the morning, uh, gratitude. What other examples you can give us on how to cultivate joy in life through the workday? I'll give you an example of a patient visit. So I had just gotten back from a week-long meditation retreat. I probably meditated for about 40 to 50 hours. So I was high on life. I was seeing love and light everywhere. And the very first patient I saw was a six-year-old with eczema. I'd been seeing her for a while, but this was a particularly down moment. As soon as I walked into the room, the energy completely shifted to one of frustration, of anxiety, of just defeat and hopelessness. And mom and her weren't sleeping at night. She was itching all night. She called herself a red monster. She was being bullied at school. And I just, I needed them to feel a little of the energy that I had just experienced over the course of the previous week. So I just made it up. We literally got in a circle. 
I had them hold my hand and then I'm also trained in heart mat. So I had them start to breathe into and out of their heart a little bit more slowly and deeply than usual. And then once I could feel that they were settled into their breath and that the energy had kind of settled down a little bit, then I had her breathe in light into her heart, breathe out fear, breathe in love into her heart, breathe out doubt, breathe in life into her heart, breathe out limitation. And then I had her send that love and that light and that life to her skin because so much of life, we're always thinking, why am I not healing? Why am I not getting better? Why is this not working? Instead of what can I do to be in the best state of being to already feel healed now? And then I had her send that love and that light and that life to her mom for taking care of her because there was so much mom guilt that she wasn't doing it enough to take care of her child, that she was failing her child. And then I had them both send that love and that light and that life to all the people out there who are dealing with eczema because when you focus on the pain and suffering of others, it lessens your own. And then I checked back in and mom was crying happy tears. She had a big smile on her face, gave me a big hug, but that was not the best part. A week later, mom sends me a message and says, you know, she's doing this exercise you taught her every night before she goes to bed. She's inviting me to invite kindness to my heart for taking care of her. She became so empowered, she decided to write a story about her eczema, how it makes her feel, what she has to do to take care of her skin. She shared it with her class. Her teacher was so moved, she asked her to share it with her school. And now the six-year-old girl, who used to be bullied, walks the halls with confidence, and she's admired for her courage and bravery. Oh, and guess what? Her eczema is better. I didn't do that. The medicines ultimately didn't do that. She did that, and she knows she did that by empowering herself with the knowledge that she's not defined or limited by her challenges. Mom is a high school teacher, she, so they invited me to the high school production of Beauty and the Beast because my patient, my sexual patient, had a cameo appearance as the pepper shaker in Be Our Guest. <laughs> so, she, so she's now center stage, and the people around me are like, oh, which one's yours? And I'm like, oh, the pepper shaker. I was so proud of what she had done for herself that I did a eczema family healing circle last summer and the theme was the power of creating your own story and I had her at six years old lead the exercise because it's one thing coming from me it's one thing coming from another kid who is on the same journey as you does she still have eczema of course she does but she's not cured of her eczema but I challenge anyone and tell me that she's not healed yeah, what a great story. And I think the lessons are pretty obvious. I want to maybe ask you, because I know now you treat mostly or only kids. What about adults? Because kids may be more receptive to these concepts just by their, you mentioned this kind of, in a positive way, childish kind of attitude towards life, which is a wonderful thing. But what about adults who are living with chronic disease a few decades into their life already? And there, it's much harder probably to break through, or is it? What do you find? In order for me to really talk about joy or even to teach about joy, I kind of have to take you back to a time that I thought I had lost it. So a lot of all of this path for me started when my own mother had a completely healthy, other than physically healthy, but she was undergoing a lot of emotional stress and she had a spontaneous ruptured brain aneurysm. And you know, wow. she's the heart of our family. She, you know, did everything. She took care of, you know, the grandkids, everything. And and so this was through us for a loop. It turned our whole world upside down. And I have to say that she survived, but I had a rude awakening. She spent 72 days in the hospital. And in that time, what I discovered is that the medicine that I had trained in saved her life, but it didn't teach her how to live and thrive in this new state of being where she couldn't physically, emotionally, mentally do the things that she used to be able to do, the things that brought her joy, taking care of her grandkids, feeding and cooking and like feed, the, nourishing the hearts and bellies of her friends and family. And for those of us who knew and loved her, it was devastating that she couldn't express emotions in the same way, that she, everything was slowed and stunted. And so for me, I mean, I went back to work. I was still working in an academic center at the time. I went back to work. And for me, life was different too. I just found myself going through the motions, forcing smiles, something that used to come so easy for me until like one day, one of the visiting professors who used to come back every summer to teach students, he not knowing that I had experienced a tragedy in the time that he was gone, came back and he was like, and realized something was very different. And he said, man, what happened here? It's like someone died. 
And it was like a slap in the face because he was right. I had let a part of myself die with the part of my mom that I had lost. And and that affected not only my energy, but the energy that I put out into the world, the energy that brought people hope and joy. And so it was the start of a transformation in the way that I live, love and served in the world. I actually, I, I no longer felt I was burned out. I no longer felt aligned with kind of seeing 50 patients a day. I was questioning who I was, my faith, my purpose. And I took a sabbatical. I took six months wow. off and ba- basically eat, pray, loved my way around the world. And I like I served in Thailand in a medical mission. I hiked the Alps. I went to my final continent, Antarctica. I took a deep dive into every healing modality that I could find to help my mom and also myself. I you know studied a little bit of traditional Chinese medicine and, and yoga and, I, and Ayurveda. And, and nutrition. And that's when I trained in Reiki with Dr. Judith Hong, who's been on this podcast before. And along the way, with me reconnecting and rediscovering my joy, I found so many different ways to heal not only myself, but my mom. And I also realized that I could teach what I learned along the way. So when I talk to kids about all of this stuff, their parents are right there. Though they actually receive a lot of this information a little bit better than most adults because we're not weighed down by all the things that have happened in our life, where we all now have to work on our inner child, it needs to be reinforced by the adults in life. And these are things that I work on with my mom. So I do meditations with her. There's connections that are forming between her heart and her brain. When I was in medical school, They literally taught us that the first six months after a brain injury is the only recovery that you're going to have. And we know now that it's been debunked over and over again because every time you are meeting someone new, learning something new, making a new connection, having a new experience, you are changing those neurons. There's neuroplasticity. You're forming new connections. And so I actually love waking up every day knowing that we know very little <laughs> because on this side of the world, we focus right. so so much on fixing and curing disease. And I think that is so limited, the power and privilege of we have of all the different ways that we can heal ourselves and our patients. Well, thank you very much, Mina. I think this was a, a tour de force and we may need to bring you back to continue this discussion. I thank you for your time, your expertise, and I hope to see you soon and bring more joy to our practices and our lives in general. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And that's a wrap for today's episode. But you know, these conversations are just way too good to end here. Wouldn't you agree, Raja? Absolutely, Hadar. That's one of the main reasons I get so excited about our conference, the Integrative Dermatology Symposium. Every year, it's a chance for us to continue expanding our minds for what's possible in dermatology for our patients and also to bring the latest clinical knowledge back to the clinic. And this year's theme has been long awaited. Do you want to spill the beans? Oh, yes. You don't want to miss this one, folks. This year's theme is Nurturing Skin Resilience, the Science of Aging and Wellness. And it's happening from September 26th to the 29th, 2024. Yes, and we'll cover topics from conventional medicine to traditional approaches, from inflammaging to exosomes, and from cosmeceuticals to women's health and more. The agenda lineup looks amazing. Not only the topics, but also the real world case discussions, workshops, and networking events. No wonder we've expanded the IDS to four days. So much more to learn and do. Plus, you can't go wrong at a brand new resort that just opened up this year at the Lowe's Arlington Hotel and Convention Center in Arlington, Texas. Texas, here we come. And For our esthetician colleagues, please join us on Sunday for the Integrative Aesthetics Track. So come check out IntegrativeDermatologySymposium.com for all the details. We hope to see you there.